Praise the Lord. God is so good to us. Turn to the person next to you and say, you don't even know how good God has been to me. Amen, amen. Well, I want to welcome everyone here to Victory Church on this wonderful day. This is the day the Lord has made, and we choose to rejoice and be glad in it, regardless of our circumstances and what we're going through, because we know our God is faithful, and we know that we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith, and faith will turn the night into the day and bring us through in Jesus' name, amen. Turn to the person next to you say, you're looking good this morning. This morning, I want to take a few moments before we get into the Word of God to encourage you with our life groups on Wednesday night. If you don't understand the value of studying the Word of God, you need to read Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest psalm. There's 176 or 178 verses, and it really is a praise to the Word of God. And this one verse of Scripture I want to give you just quickly Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of your words give light. The entrance, when, when God's word comes in, when God's word walks in, light begins to shine. It gives understanding to the simple. Understanding to the simple. The power of God's word is incredible. When, when the word of God comes in, it gives light. That means it exposes things. That means things that are in the darkness begin to scatter. How many of you have ever been in a place where uh, when the light was off, you didn't know what was going on, but as soon as you put the lights on, the cockroaches began to scatter? I've, I've been in some places, um, I've been in some places uh, where you, you didn't know what was in the cupboards until the light came on. And, and there's a lot of things, come on, uh, 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 there's a spiritual application. There's a lot of things in your life. Come on, don't let me look at you. Don't let me read your mail this morning. There's a lot of things that, that hide in the darkness, and you need the light. Come on, the entrance of your word scatters the darkness. The devil works in secrecy and in silence. The devil works in places of your life and in my life where, the, where we shut the door and close it off and don't allow the light to shine. But we want the word to shine. Amen. We want the entrance of the word to bring light. That means it brings clarity. It, it makes manifest. It, it reveals things. Amen. Because if not, we're going to believe some lies and those lies are going to destroy our lives. Amen. So, so what we want to do is encourage you on Wednesday nights, since we broke off, we used to have Bible study for many, many years just in one room. Now that we've broke, broken off into several rooms, we're beginning to develop relationships, get to know people a little bit better, and we'll be able to interact with the material a little bit more. And so this coming quarter, beginning the first Wednesday, we will have several new classes that will be just phenomenal to help you grow in different areas of your life. So I want to just ask all of our group, uh, life group facilitators to just come forward very quickly, very quickly, just move forward. Um, I'm going to ha have them give a one-minute commercial for uh, what is available on Wednesday nights in the different groups. See, the, the, the vision or the plan is just to get us into small groups and to interact with the material, to be able to study it and share in a smaller context. So we have several different groups, and the group that I'm going to be teaching, I'm very excited about it. I don't know if you ever heard of Dave Ramsey. Total Money Makeover. There is a book and a workbook with this that is just phenomenal. It's going to, the cost, there are costs for uh, some of these. Some of these, we uh, will not have any costs because it's just printing material, but we are not doing this as, it's no fundraising. Uh, actually, this is $26, but we're selling it for $25, the book and the workbook. Now, all of the books we want to make available, you have to buy it. Don't just sign up, you got to pay up. Turn to the person next to you, say, don't just sign up, pay up. About 30% of you just did that, amen. I read a statistic that 80% of people in this country, 80% live paycheck to paycheck. 
Now, now listen, here's a key. Here's something very important. You think, well, that's people that don't make a lot of money. 80%, that's people who make 100000 200000 300000 a year. They're still living paycheck to paycheck. Because what we fail to understand, it's not just about income, it's about outcome. It's not just about inflow, it's about outflow. This will, I'm telling you, I can guarantee if you work this, it'll work for you. If you, if you are in any kind of, and it's not just if you're in debt, this is just to be a better steward. See, a lot of times in the church, we teach people, now the rest of you, don't do as I say, do it, don't do as I do, do as I say, don't take long, as long as I'm taking. I'm just kicking it off, you know, I'm just kicking it off. We teach people about tithing, we fail to teach them about the 90% that remains. And a lot of people can't tithe because they're spending a hundred, a dollar seven, dollar ten for every dollar they make. That's another statistics that's just uh, frightening. But anyway, this is one of the classes my wife and I will be facilitating. And we like to say it's facilitating. We're not teaching. We're not lecturing. It's facilitating so that there could be greater interaction and participation by you all. Amen? Praise God. I'm going to be teaching on Christian living. This is a class for new believers, but also for people that have been in the Lord for many years and really never have a firm script, scriptural foundation. This helps you get into Bible study. It gets you into digging into the word. We had people that are newly saved, people that have been in the Lord for many years in my last class, and you see the transformation in their lives as they dug into the word and the light of the word really made it alive to them. And, you know, it helps uh, to give you breakthroughs and help you to stand firm when the difficulties, the trials, the temptations come. You need the word of God. Every lesson has this memory verse. And in the back of the book, it has a memory verse card that you can carry around throughout the week to get that word in your heart. As the psalmist said, you know, I hid the word of God in my heart that I may not sin against you. So if you want to stand against the difficulties in life and be able to walk and even to share your faith with others, this is a great class, even if you've been in the Lord for a long time, but you want to be able to uh, tell others about Christ and express your faith to them, this will help. Amen. Good morning, Victory. Uh, I'm going to be teaching or facilitating a class um, on... Celebrate Recovery is the uh, study that we're going to use. Don't be fooled by the title. It's, it's not just for uh, drug addicts and alcoholics. It's not AA. It's not NA. Um, it's all Christ-centered, um, and it's basically to uh, overcome your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups and get rid of the, the life-controlling things that control your life that don't let God in. Um, so join us on Wednesday nights. Um, I hope that you, know, you find peace and strength in, in recovery. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I will, myself and uh, Brad Bra Brennard will be teaching on uh, on prayer. Talk. Uh, I will be using the book "Talking with God" by Dr. Stanley. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, I was with my sister. He was telling uh, somebody. He was telling somebody, encouraging a, a man. A man said, because the man was facing challenge, challenges. He was encouraging this man. Said, "Can you pray?" Just start praying. Maybe God will turn things around. And the man said, Madam, whenever I pray, things get worse. So many of us, you know, many of us, we talk about prayer. We don't know about prayer. And uh, we don't know why some of our prayers are being hindered. But Jesus said, oh, no, Paul, in the Luke chapter 1, no, Jesus was telling the disciples, uh, one of the disciples, he was telling them about things to do. And then one of them asked a question, say, Lord, teach us how to pray. It's not that they don't know how to pray. They have seen the Jews, every Jewish man knows how to pray. But he, he asked Jesus to teach us how to pray. Why? Because he wants to know why their prayers are not getting breakthroughs. He wants to know there's something deeper in prayer. So with this book, we believe that studying through this book, working together as a team, that we come to know why some of our prayers are being hindered, why some of our prayers are not answered. Remember, like in the Home Depot, in Home Depot, they have a train they call 
teach yourself training, which they will teach you how to use some of the tools you buy from them. But sometimes, you know, people need to know about this thing. Like in, in the in book, don't always wait for your pastor to pray for you. Sometimes you, you may be in a position whereby you need to do it for yourself. And you want to know why these prayers are not working. Maybe through this book, going through this book, and through our interaction and testimony, we come to discover why some of our prayers are not being answered. Good morning, church. I've lost my voice, but I'll do the best I can. My husband and I, well, I brought it in two weeks ago, will be teaching a class which is entitled The Emotionally Strong Church. The purpose of this study is to help us to build strong relationships, which we started already in our small groups, being emotionally stable so that we can fulfill the purpose for which Christ has called us and we'll be able to rejoice in our trials. We'll be able to stand firm until Christ comes. We'll be able to fulfill the common mission of victory. That is doing what? Who knows it? I like to be interactive. There are three things. What's our mission? Reach who? Restore who? And revive who? See, some of us will get 10%, but I'm very <laughs> merciful. So we should know this offhand. If, so this is what our class is about. When we are stable, when we come together united, then we can fulfill our common goal. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. So the class that I'm going to be teaching is called the Daniel Plan. Um, don't get nervous. This is not the Daniel fast. Or I wouldn't be standing up here, okay? <laughs> this is not the Daniel fast. You can eat meat. You can eat dairy. Um, it's just trying to, you know, get healthier. Uh, as the author of this book, Rick Warren says, I believe that God is wanting to decrease the size of the congregation. I'm a, hold on for one second. Not in numbers, but in the waistline. <laughs> okay, so... So that, that's what it's about, really trying to get a little bit healthier. It's a Bible-based study in which we're just going to incorporate and, and discuss some simple ways to incorporate healthy choices into our lifestyle um, by using faith, food, fitness, focus, and friends. And um, I've been on a, a bit of a health journey for a little while, um, for a couple months now, and um, so far I've lost a little over 30 pounds. The doctor died. <laughs> Thank you. Thank God. Um, the beginning, let me see, the end of September, I had gone to the doctor and gotten some blood work and things like that done. The doctor told me that I had diabetes. I'm like, the devil is a liar. I'm not receiving this right here. You know, family history of diabetes and things. And I'm like, God, you know, I'm trusting you for healing. But sometimes, you know, we trust God for certain things, but we have some personal responsibility in it to be, you know, God has called us to be stewards, not just of our finances, but of what he's entrusted with. This is, you know, the body that God has given us. And so he wants us to use that to glorify him, uh, you know, and to be a good steward of that. And so um, after I, you know, the doctor had given me that report, I'm like, you know, God, I'm not receiving. But yet there were some things that I needed to do. So I started changing up the way that I was eating, getting some more sleep, um, exercising. And I went back to the doctor four months later and she said, guess what? You no longer have diabetes. Praise, Praise the God. Lord. Praise God. God is good. But that, but that was as a result of me making some personal choices and incorporating my faith. I'd be exercising, rebuking the devil, not eating haagen rebuking the devil, but ex <laughs> exercising and rebuking the devil, like, in the name of Jesus, this is a body of a woman of God, and sickness and disease can't stay here, as I'm, like, breaking a sweat, exercising. So, you know, I'm excited for the health journey that I'm in right now, and I'm trusting that, you know, God might be speaking to some other folks to, you know, get in the health journey and See, as we're faithful, what God will do in our lives as well. Amen. Amen. That's faith and works. The, the last life group is to, we meet in the sanctuary. And because we meet in the sanctuary, we're a little bit of, on the larger side, a little bit of a different dynamic. Uh, when we started this, we started with the book of Ephesians. Uh, and basically, this particular life group is dealing with the Bible. Uh, so we're learning not just about the Bible, though we do a great introduction, but we're learning the Bible. 
And we started with Ephesians. This quarter, we're going to be finishing Philippians. And the next quarter, we're going to be starting the book of uh, Colossians. And we're going to be ending with Philemon. And those in our life group know that those are Paul's prison epistles. Just another learning thing that we've never known before. So we're learning the Bible. We're also learning about ourselves. We're all in different spiritual levels. Somebody might be ahead. Somebody might be behind. Some just got started. Some have been around for a long time. But we're learning that we all, our input is all valuable. And it's all eye-opening. And it's been a breath of fresh air to see people come. Uh, you know, and they offer their intake on certain things. Sometimes we'll finish the class after three ver verses. Other times it's the whole chapter. But we're learning about the Bible. We're learning about ourselves. And we're also learning about learning. Learning can be very intimidating. And if you're on the older side, you know, we learn a little differently. But we're learning that it doesn't have to paralyze us. And we have something to offer. And you'd be surprised that people that come have their lessons ready or they've, re they've read their study and they have something to input, whether it be a small amount or whether it be a, a, a large amount. It's always something there. So I encourage you, if you haven't signed up for a class, sign up for a class. And by the way, my books are free. No. Um, if it's free, it's for you. Amen. 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 Well, we have all of these uh, the classes or the books out in the foyer. Please sign up. Please pay up. We will not order the books unless, um, you know, they're, they're accounted for and they're paid for. If by chance, financially, you are not able, we do not want anybody to miss out on a class. If you're not able, you could always come to the sanctuary class. That's free of charge. Um, but if there's a class you're really passionate about, you want to be a part, um, you could let us know. Just remember Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. Praise the Lord. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Ruth Depar. She is currently the senior clinical pharmacist specialist at Lifespan Pharmacy. Wait a minute, there's a lot of accolades here. Hold, hold your applause. Lifespan Pharmacy Ambulatory Care Services in Providence. She was instrumental in the development of 14 pharmacist-managed ambulatory services, both in primary care and specialty medicine, clinical services within the Lifespan Health System and private physician offices in Rhode Island. Ruth's vast experience in direct patient care, academics, and leadership has led her to establish a solid foundation of knowledge. It enables her to coordinate and execute and complete projects, develop teams, build consensus, remove obstacles to increase productivity, build strategic relationship, and increase communication with executive management. This morning, she's going to share sort of an introduction to the topic her and her husband are going to facilitate on being emotionally healthy as a church. You know what I have found in my 30 years experience as a pastor? Some people can be very spiritual, but they're not that emotionally stable. And it's really an oxymoron because if you're truly biblically spiritual, you'll have the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance, self-control, and the like. But sometimes people have a wrong concept of spirituality. They could be very spiritual but very bitter. They could be very spiritual but very angry. They could be very spiritual but very proud. That's really an, in, uh, an oxymoron and inconsistent. But if we become spiritually or emotionally mature, it's really integrating our faith in every area of our life. So I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. De Ruth Depar who has accomplished great, great things and been very successful in her field. But most importantly, most significant, she's a lover of Jesus. She's a follower of Christ, not only in the church, but in the workplace and in her home. And one other thing about her, she loves dogs. Sometimes she'll ask about my family, but I think she loves my dog more than she loves my kids, my wife, and me. She asks about... How's the baby doing? God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. I'm really humbled by this introduction. You know social media. I think you got it from my LinkedIn. 
thank you for allowing me to use your pulpit. And family, I'm here today to share with you my heart. And we don't just arrive where we are at by chance. We all are created to relate to other people. Nobody is an island. Even those who own their own businesses, they have to interact with their clients and customers. And being emotionally stable is a key ingredient to being successful in life. Whether you are a two-year-old, an adult, it works everywhere. And the business world noticed it earlier. They are succeeding. Health world, we're catching on. How about as the church? It's something that we have to know and use. And as I was thinking about what to share, I've shared this message nationwide to large groups, whatever, in ministries, to different kinds of professionals. But thinking about the church, this is my first time. And I was thinking, Lord, what do I share? And I was laboring over it. He says, tell the story. And the story is my story. Growing up as the youngest of six children, there are other half brothers and sisters too, our home was a gathering place. My mom was nurturing, but she was an introvert. My dad was the extrovert, fun-loving guy. And I was the youngest, and I was a people pleaser because I had to serve the needs of my older brethren. And I learned grow up that I don't want people to be angry with me. I learned to hold on my emotions and not express it because I didn't want anyone to get angry with me. People will look at me, and I, if they don't look at me, the next time, oh, what did I do wrong? It was always me. Who can relate to that? Anybody here? Am I the only one? And friends would tell me I wore my um, emotions on my sleeves. I could be laughing one minute, the next minute I'm like down. And my husband can attest to it. He can leave the house, I'm smiling, he comes back. What's wrong? Nothing. And we, <laughs> we all do that. But something significant happened in my life. I had many friends, but I was still lonely. Can anybody relate to that? I'd feel, and I've been a Christian since 13 years. I read my Bible, I pray tongues, I do everything, but I felt that loneliness, and I'd always have issues. If something happened, I ran to my friends. I was lit, sitting on the edge. Can anyone relate to that? When I was a teenager, I had my own mind. If I had a plan, my friend decides to do something else, I go with them. Why? Why? Because I was pleasing men, and God, my ultimate goal is to please God. So one day, I traveled a lot. I was walking through the airport, but back to something else happened. I was stripped to the bare ground. All my friends, because I had taken a stand to make a decision for something I felt was good for me. And my friends did not like it because they did not, I, they wanted me to listen to them. And because of that, I felt more lonely. But someone, and today our memory verse will be from Ruth. We'll find out what Ruth did for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Stood up and said, we're going to live by the word of God. And with the word of God, encourage me, pray through the word. I became strong. But then I rediscovered a whole new thing that loving my Savior and pleasing him is the utmost thing. The whole world can be against us. But if we have God and we know that we're doing what he wants us to do, we'll be strong. When we're emotionally strong, we'll not be like the wind being tossed about by every wave. We will not need to pick up the phone. No, we'll go to the throne room and then relax. We'll have peace. And as we're learning in Philippians, or we haven't finished yet, we'll be able to rejoice in our trials because we know whom we've believed. We'll be able to stand firm and stand in unity. When we go wrong and we correct it, we'll not be proud. We'll humble ourselves. We'll have the same attitude as Christ had. Okay, so I found this book, and there was one key called Emotional Intelligence. It wasn't very popular until the 1990s. Two, has anybody heard of it? Anybody in their field? Yeah, two psychologists, Solovey and Mayer. And then in 1995, another psychologist, Goldman, came out and said that emotional intelligence may be more important than emotion, uh, intelligence quotient, IQ. 
And from now onwards, I'll refer to it as EI. And then they found principles. But all these are ingrained in the Bible. All throughout the world, from Genesis to Revelations, God has given us this key. So why don't we use it? So, next slide, please. This is my goal. I've tried it. I've learned it. And I'm completely a different person. If God can change me, he can change anyone. Talk about the wind. And my husband knows. Tears, they fall like rain. When I was a kid, I'd cry. My mom would put a bowl down. Fill it up with your tears. And my dad will carry me and say, oh, stop crying. No, we have to be firm. So there are four, two main components of emotional intelligence. That's self-competence. That means that you are competent in yourself, but we know that as Christians, our confidence is in the Lord. And social competence. Self-competence has two other ingredients, self-awareness and self-management. Then the social competent is you being socially aware and relationship management. The key principle of developing in this area, and there's biblical truth. We'll be learning it in my group. We'll take it point by point. These are just two points that I've put up. And as you know already, I love dogs. Dogs have emotions, whether you like it or not. And God demonstrated his love for us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus, when he came, he said that the greatest commandment is to love God with our mind, our hearts, our souls, everything. And the next one is to love our neighbor as ourselves. So before we can love our neighbor, we should love ourselves. And that self-love should reflect the love we have for God with our soul, our mind, our flesh. How can we love ourselves? We have to know ourselves. Emotions are good. There's no emotion that's bad. If we did not feel angry, people will walk over us. If we did not have love, we cannot relate to people. And love is the greatest commandment. And expression of love to God and to others is important. But you know what? As humans, we cannot love perfectly. It's God who will give us that strength. Because these bad emotions will also rear their head. Anger, bitterness, forgi unforgiveness, all those things. But with Christ and us managing ourselves, we can take control of all that and steer ourselves in unity to achieve what God wants to do in us. So look at that dog looking in the mirror. Not my dog doesn't look in the mirror and smile at himself. Some dogs bark, those who know dogs, when they see themselves. So I'll just talk about two points. These are just two. There are several others. You have to know yourself, know your personal disposition. Some of us are laid back. Nothing phases us. We are just calm. Some of us, we are, and it all depends on our temperaments. It's something that we are born with. And then we develop the personality. The temperament is like a slide, a plain sheet of paper that you come in. And we'll get into that in detail in our class. And you build upon it. Your personality is what you develop. I'll give you an example. Somebody may be laid back. That they are born with it. They, nothing faces them. There's a term for it. I don't get into it. Then they develop their personality is laziness. They don't care about anything, so they don't do anything. They become lazy. Some of us are born with a type A character. We are leaders, natural leaders, want things lined up. Then we develop the attitude of we driving people. And what do they call us? Tax or trade? Uh, what do you call it? We, we run people or we run them over to our team. None of them is good. And nobody has one personality. We can work towards it. We learned in Philippians 2 that we should work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And we'll learn that God can give us the strength to do that. Embrace every emotion, whether it's anger. When you know that I can become angry. Yes, this person takes my button off. He's coming. He's going to say, you prepare yourself. And you are able to respond instead of reacting. Next one is people don't like to be by themselves to think. I was one of such persons to think about exactly what you do. Whether we like it or not, 
our actions come from our emotions, our thinking, and they cause a ripple effect. It doesn't just affect us alone. I can start, the Bible said somewhere that we should make sure that no root of bitterness develop in us and infect the other people. Whatever happens, whether good or bad, it spreads. So it's not just about us. Let's go to the next one. So the next one is self-management. Has anyone seen an angry dog? That's an angry puppy over there. And we know, I'll go back to the self-awareness. If you don't know yourself, go reflect. We have Bible verses. The Lord himself, he made us. He knows us. He says in 2 Corinthians 13 verse 5 that examine yourself. I'm not going to tell Maureen. She knows and God knows. He created you. Before you were formed, he knew in them to reveal to you areas where you need to improve. And we cannot hide from him. There's nowhere in Psalm 139 it says, Oh Lord, you know me when I lay down, when I rise up. You know my intricate being. So go to the Lord. He'll show you who you are. Keeping our cool means managing ourselves. We all have been taught that count to 10. Don't just get angry. Does it always work? No. And Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, once said that it's easy to be angry, right? But to be angry with the right person at the right time for the right purpose and express it to the right degree, that's not easy. And I totally agree with him. And there's another um, person who picked Max Groucho in a show in the 1950s. I wasn't born then. He said that speak when you are angry and you make the best speech you ever regret. Okay. So this is why, and we know in the Bible, James tells us that be slow to speak. What does he say? Quick to hear and slow to anger. Okay. Slow to anger. And the Bible says that the angry man is like a man without walls. Proverbs 28. You are broken down and anybody can come in. And one thing I've learned in my journey is about boundaries. All this I'm saying, if you put it into practice, young people, you succeed personally, professionally. You create a peaceful environment. People like to be around you. And there's nothing that you want done that you can't get done by God's grace. Uphold your core values. If you know who you are and what you stand for, there will be no compromises. And you'll be bold to stand for what you believe in. So that's important. There are others. And upholding your core values, there are all verses. We'll learn them and other points in our class. Next slide, please. So this is about social awareness. I love dogs when they get together and they are playing. Carefree. Carefree. And this comes from connecting at a deeper level. We meet people who say, hi. We don't even look in their faces. If we just attentive and we'll observe and we'll listen, there's something called active listening. Not just listening to the words. Listen to what is being said, what is unspoken. Even in emails or letters, you can read what in text messages, what is behind it. The intentions. That shows you truly care. We are a body of Christ, and we should care beyond just, hello, how are you? But that opens us up. We become vulnerable. And some people, we've retreated into our corners because we opened up and we got hurt. You know what? There's nothing worse than not loving. I'd rather love a million times and get burnt than not love. So if you are retreating, just come out. God has more for us. There's healing in the house of God. There's strength in numbers. If you are connected, you may not even know what's happening, but someone will be praying for you. And this is what we should be doing for one another. Even when you see someone and they haven't spoken, you should be able to tell. I know the team I work with. They know me. I know them. Sometimes I just see them. I know something is not right. And that is how we should be in the house of God. The true believers, God says that people will see our love for one another and know that we are his disciples. Then be sensitive to environment. The atmosphere in our church is changing. And we all should come up and rise up 
to that strength, that unity that will help us fulfill our goal of doing what God commanded us to do. That's to win souls for him. But he doesn't want us to be broken. If people come to broken church, what will happen? They'll also be broken. So we have to be strong so that as we bring people in, we'll be there to support them. We'll be here to support one another. Nobody should suffer alone. Or nobody should go through and say, oh, the church doesn't care. Pastor cannot do everything. No. But if we are connected to our group member, whoever, they'll know and they'll support us. And we won't see if pastor doesn't do it. We don't care. And to tell you the truth, when you become strong in emotionally, you'll be able to take things from Christ. The next one. How many minutes do I have, pastor? Relationship management. Okay. Relationship management, that's empathy. If you haven't worked, and these points are just snippets of what we'll go into. There's a lot, a lot. Empathy, if you haven't worked in someone's shoes, don't judge them. Okay? And if we learn to empathize with people, not sympathy, like, oh, poor Pastor Mike, your baby fell down. No, that's not it. Empathy is trying to see things from their perspective trying to understand why they are behaving in the way they are behaving. They may have snapped at you, but don't take offense. You don't know what's going on in you. Give them the benefit of the doubt. And the Bible tells us that we should esteem others better than ourselves. So there are so many things. We've learned in Philippians 2 to 3 that we should not seek our own interests, seek the interests of others. We've learned all this. It all ties in with the word of God. Conflict resolution. There cannot be any true relationship where there's honesty and transparency, where there will be disagreement. We can disagree, but we can agree to move on. And relationships are built on trust. Whether we like it or not, the conflicts as we work through them, that's what strengthens the relationship. It makes it sweeter and it makes it stronger. You know that the other person has your back, you have their back. We have to get to that level. And I'll talk about Ruth chapter 2. I can't read everything. We'll read, I said chapter 2. Ruth, my own namesake. I'll use her as an example. And I've learned a lot from here. It's just four chapters. It's after the book of Judges and it's before Samuel. When you go home, take time to read it. Naomi, whose name means pleasantness. There was hunger in their home. They moved to another place, Moab, to live there. Then her husband died. Her sons married, were grown. They married two women, Opa and Ruth. And these men, it, the Bible says 10 years. After 10 years, they died. That means that the women were childless for 10 years. And those who are struggling with infertility, you know how difficult it is. Then these two men also die. Naomi says, I'm done. I'm going back home. There's now food in my county. And her daughters-in-law were going with her. They started with her, but she said, go back. I have nothing left for you. You go with your families, marry and move on and enjoy. They cried, say, we'll go. Then one of them went back. Opa went back, kissed her goodbye and went back. But Ruth clung to her. She was also in pain, but she did not like Paul in Philippians writing the letter. He was in jail, but he wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about the Philippians. And thanking them for what they've done, sending someone to encourage them. So Ruth was said, I'll go with you. Where you go, I'll go. Your God will be my your God, my God. I'll die where you die. She went with her mother-in-law. That's empathy. She could have easily gone back to her people. Who knows what would have happened to Naomi if Ruth hadn't gone with her? So Naomi, when she reached and the people came around, they say, Isn't this Naomi? Isn't it caused a ruckus? That shows me that they were well known before they left. Because even after so many years, so are you known in your workplace? What are you known for? And when they said, Naomi is here, Naomi is here, if she was a bitter person or something, nobody would say, oh, she's here again. Look at her. No, but they ran to her, oh, Naomi is here. What did she say? No, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitterness. I'm not pleasant. Call me bitterness. Who is here that you've let your situation define who you are? Situations and conditions don't define us. God defines us. And we have to take stand and call ourselves by what God has called us. 
We are a chosen generation. We are more than victorious through Christ our Lord. We are stable. We are the children of God. We are mighty through God. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, that power lives in us. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So Naomi went on. She lived with Ruth. Ruth lived in all these. There are lessons in all this. Ruth lived with her mother-in-law. She listened to her. Ruth was kind. Even when she went out to glean, she got food to eat. She left some for her mother-in-law. Do we care for one another? Come Christmas, we all come here with our stuff. We go to our friends with gifts. Are we looking for those among us who don't have anyone bringing something to them? Mother's Day, whatever. Are we looking to tell a single mother, good job for taking care of your children? This is what God wants us to do. He calls us to see beyond the physical. And by Ruth staying with them, she did what her mother-in-law said to do. She got married to Boaz. But Boaz, before he married Ruth, had to go to the next kin, the man of kin, the next in kin, and say he followed the rules. So there are orders everywhere we live in the church, in society. So if we are here as a community, as a family, we have to go by the laid down orders. There's authority that we have to submit to, pastor's authority. And if we see him as our father, I'm not saying this because he's sitting here. If I do something and he scolds me, I'll say, yes, dad, and I'll go back and reflect. And I won't be angry because he's called me up on something. We all have to recognize that. And through Ruth being with Naomi Boaz, she gave birth to Obed, who is the great, 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 great grandfather of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when she gave birth, the same people came around again. Hey, Naomi, God has given you a child. Blessed be you among what they taught. It's in Ruth chapter 4, towards the end. And they said that God bless your daughter-in-law who loved you more than seven sons. Do we have this love for one another? so that we'll forget about our own problems and minister to them. Are we always looking for people to pat us on the back or say, don't cry? Will we step out of our own situation to minister to others? All this is about emotional intelligence. And I'll end by saying there's no friend like Jesus. I was reading this um, thing today. I'll read it out. I don't know the whole thing, and I've lost my voice, so I can't sing, but I'll read it out to Jesus. There's not a friend like the only Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows um, none else could heal our soul's um, diseases. And this could be head, could be hunger, could be hunger, could be instability. And to tell you the truth, when you are secure, you know yourself secure in the Lord, nothing will face you. That security will help you to humble yourself and do everything. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide us till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. So I want us to close our eyes. This is, hasn't been easy, but if you submit yourself to him, he will guide you. You know, even from the little we've heard now, what you need to do. And I ask the Lord. Father, we thank you for coming to you this morning. You have made us emotional beings. Lord, you have spoken to us and we're responding to your love. Touch our hearts, guide us, and give us a humble heart so that we'll have the same attitude that you had. As we go forth, help us to stand strong and firm in you, that this church will be a sanctuary for the broken, for the hurting, for the lost, And Lord, you bring us to a deeper level of love for one another. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing. It's going to be an excellent class. Praise the Lord. As we just prepare to say the final amen and dismiss, just want to encourage you. No matter where you are at in your walk with God, victory is a healthy church. I don't say that because I'm the pastor, but uh, you should say amen because if you're not saying amen, amen, that means you shouldn't be here because if you don't think it's a healthy church, right, amen, you want to be in a healthy place, amen. And I believe we have some awesome 
members, awesome people who love God. And again, we're all at different places in our walk with God. But the essence of who we are is really we're called to follow Jesus. Amen. We're called to be disciples, right? Jesus, his great commission when he left the earth, the final words that he gave to his people, his disciples, his church, he said, I want you to go and make disciples. And I want you to teach them all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And it's critical that we understand that because a lot of times in churches and in ministries, we make decisions for Christ. But that's not good enough. Jesus didn't say make decisions, have people raise their hand, yeah, I want to follow Jesus. That might be the first step. He said make disciples. And you know what the root or part of the word or the, another word we get from disciple? Discipline. I'm not talking about discipline while well, you can't go out because you didn't eat your peas or your carrots. You've got to stay home tonight. No, I'm talking about developing as a follower of Christ. Discipline means that you have to work sometimes and you have to read and study. And a lot of times in churches, we expect the preacher and the teacher to feed us. And, 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 they, and they should, but that's not our only diet. We have to learn how to feed ourselves. Amen. You know, the old saying, if you give someone a fish, you feed them for one day. But if you teach them how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. And the important thing is that we learn as followers of Jesus, we learn how to feed ourselves. Amen. I've heard people, not in this church, because we give a good menu, we give a good banquet. But some people, oh, I'm not being fed, I'm not being fed. Well, why don't you grow up and feed yourself? Now, don't get offended, because I'm not talking to anybody here. I'm talking to people... But amen, we all need to learn how to feed ourselves the Word of God. And part of it is our life groups. It's a way for us to interact and learn from one another and, and share with one another and grow together. So I want to encourage you. You need to walk out your faith. You need to grow in your faith. You need to develop. All of us do. And it happens in community. It happens in a healthy environment. And this place is it. But you need to put some discipline to your discipleship. You need to get out of your lazy boy and get into the house of God on Wednesday night. Whatever's on TV isn't more important than what's happening here. Amen? Well, I'm tired. Well, a lot of us are tired, but we still make it out to the house of God. Well, I'm busy. Yeah, we're all busy, but we still make it a priority to come and to grow in our faith and to grow in relationship with one another. As, as our sister shared, there are people here that need you to show up, not just to be a body next to them, but maybe to pray for them, encourage them, maybe to be just an example to them. And we all grow together in community. So before you leave, be sure to see that sign-up table and sign up, pay up, and be a part of what we're doing here on Wednesday night. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together tonight. Sit down, I'm going to preach some more so I can be accurate. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you just lift your hands and just thank God this morning. Come on. The greatest, the greatest emotion, I believe, is gratefulness. So the greatest expression to God is, is being grateful, to be thankful for all God has done, even this morning. Come on, you received something from God. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise today. We thank you for everyone here this morning. We know that they are loved. We know that your word is true. And God, that you have a plan and a purpose for them. Father God, we just thank you that the entrance of your word brings light. It brings life. It brings vitality. So, Father God, I pray that your people would make a commitment to apply themselves to walk out their faith in a very real and practical way in this church, in relationship to one another. God, we thank you for the messages we heard. We thank you for the songs that were sung, the prayers that were prayed, the offering that was given. And, Father God, now we pray you'd bless our fellowship as we leave this place. May we even take time to interact with one another and to to enjoy the fellowship of your people. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen and amen. Go, take, enjoy our new flooring and our...